Hi, I'm Bernie Flynn. At New Jersey Manufacturers Insurance Company, we believe that all citizens need to be informed about the important issues that affect their daily lives. That's why we're proud to support programming produced by Caucus Educational Corporation and their partners in public television. Funding for this edition of Caucus New Jersey has been provided by Adler Aphasia Center, helping stroke and brain injury survivors recover their speech. Wells Fargo, Seton Hall University, where leaders learn. PSE&G, committed to improving New Jersey's economy and strengthening its communities. New Jersey Sharing Network, dedicated to saving lives through organ and tissue donation. NJM, auto insurance, homeowners insurance, and more, with a focus on safety and financial stability. And by Josh S. Weston. Hi, I'm Steve Adubato. The next uh, 10 minutes or so uh, is going to be important because we're going to be covering some important health and medical uh, content that uh, could make a difference in, in your life or those who are closest to you. And to do that, we're joined by Matt Ostroff, who is lead clinician and vascular access coordinator of the vascular access program at St. Joseph's Healthcare System, and Joanna Portella, who is the mother of a beautiful little girl by the name of Angelina, who is two and a half as we do this program. And she has benefited from the program Matt runs now. Angelina is dealing with what particular ailment? She has a rare genetic disorder. It's called pyruvate dehydrogenase deficiency. It's metabolic. Um, it's an energy deficiency, basically. Her body doesn't metabolize energy. So when she eats food, you know, it doesn't turn it into energy to do things like walk, talk, systems, functioning. And so she has had to, since the day she was born, we met her, she's out with some of our producers who can't get enough of her right now. Yeah. Um, we're talking to her and playing with her, but she has been poked and veins have been looked for since the day she was born? Yeah, pretty much. Um, we've gone as far as arteries in her neck and arteries in her groin, and it's, it's rough because you don't want to see your kid stuck in places that they shouldn't be stuck. And, you know, it's sad. It's very sad. So I'm just happy to have programs like these available for her. So at nine months of age, you find out about this program at St. Joseph's? Yeah. And this guy? Mm hmm What is the program, and how has it helped little girls like Angelina and so many others? Describe it. Sure. And we'll, by the way, we'll show some pictures as we do this to try to make it come alive. Sure. So vascular... Without actually demonstrating it. <laughs> yeah, sure. So vascular access is the most commonly performed procedure in medicine. It's called vascular access. Mm -hmm. Which is basically obtaining access to either your vein or your artery to either administer medication or to do hemodynamic monitoring. Um, what we've done, and I'm so excited to tell you about, we've perfected vascular access through the use of ultrasound. And uh, what we're able to do is see your veins now or your arteries, and we can guide a needle in and see it directly go into the lumen of the vessel, the circle, which are your veins or your arteries. Lumen, the opening. Yes, yes, the hole. Right. Um, go right in there and provide access 99% on the first attempt. So let's take a step back. Yeah. It's the ultrasound that allows you and your colleagues to see where the lumen is where the needle should go previously without that? Previously, it was blind sticking. It was very good palpation techniques. You had excellent nurses that some could do it and some couldn't. Ultrasound completely levels the field. It's obviously a specialized skill, but what it allows you to do is go in and do the procedure rather than try. And the results are absolutely just amazing. Um, and we can apply it from adults all the way to the NICU, the tiny little babies. What ha be specific. Mm -hmm. What has it done for Angelina? It just, you know, not having to worry about, I have so much to worry about with her in her life that this is just one thing that, you know, makes my life easier. I don't have to worry about her crying. I don't have to worry about her being in pain. He actually stuck her twice in each arm and not a peep came out of her because he knew exactly where he was going. She didn't cry. and. Like I said, it's just one less thing that I have to worry about. I mean, my life with Angelina is so stressful. She's so medically compromised that 
I don't want to have to be like, oh, I have to go get labs done. Like this just makes my life so much easier. So, so I hate, to, and this is no, in no way, a negative reflection on the wonderful nurses and who we admire, respect, and and uh, revere and, and and feature very often in public broadcasting. This is different because even the best nurse trying to find mm -hmm. where that vein is, it's challenging. Yeah, I mean, she. Because of all her medical issues, she has very small veins. They're yes. very difficult to find. So, you know, before we found this program at St. Joe's, they would stick her and fish for it and fish for it until it would catch and then they would get it. But I mean, it's like holding down your child. Right. I, I yeah. I, w w uh, without disclosing too much, our, our son, Chris, is 12. He has veins that are hard to find. It's in nowhere anything like what mm -hmm. you're talking about. And I remember holding him down in the emergency room several times, the best nurses trying to find it. And they said, listen, his veins collapse. They're hard to find. This would make it easier for him. And so many other kinds of patients, describe the kinds of patients, even older patients. Yeah, and, and like to your point, the nurses are not bad at IVs. No, it has nothing to do the with that. The patient population that we're facing, due to the advancements in medicine, they're living longer. We're getting chronic patients here. Sickle cell patients are living longer. Our cystic fibrosis patients, um, our chronic renal failure patients, these are the ones with the most difficult veins to access. And what ultrasound does is it just opens up your eyes and you can see every little piece. And again, you can assess, you can carefully assess and find the exact place to go. And, and make it happen as long as you ha do use the correct proper technique right. which we've developed it's it's basically foolproof we can get access on almost any but don't you sorry for interrupting don't you preserve veins in the process absolutely explain that so the whole goal is to think about what's going to happen next what are we going to do the next time you come to the hospital right. or in 10 years from now so what i try to do especially on yeah, like, play that out Sure. On our sickle cell population, what I'll do, they used to get pick lines, which are central lines. Yes. This is what I was brought in I've for. I've had one. So <laughs> Dr. Connolly is our chairman of surgery. Yes. He brought me in to take the pick lines out of interventional radiology and allow those radiologists to do very complex procedures. And what happened was I was alone in this 700-bed trauma center, and I was getting 20 orders a day, and I couldn't keep up with it. But I started looking at what they were ordering these devices for, and they weren't necessary for a pick. We could use an IV, but how could we get that in? So I started doing the ultrasound guided IVs, and you can map out veins from wow. the lower forearm up, mm -hmm. and you can preserve all this upper arm vasculature. So like our children with cystic fibrosis, they usually always get a midline, which is a long catheter in yes. the arm, or a central line. I'm getting them through their antibiotic therapy with our pulmonologist, Dr. Najahan, with peripheral IVs now. So we're preserving vasculature as they grow, and it's going to extend their lives. When was this technology, or when did this technology become perfected? Back in 2010, ERs started using ultrasound on uh, the patients to get IVs. And I was an ER nurse back then, and the director of uh, the ultrasound said, kid, do you want to learn this? <laughs> I said, sure, why not, because I was a paramedic. I liked all this Now you're stuff. a nurse practitioner. Yes, sir. Just recently happened. Congratulations. Thank you very much. And the reason I became a nurse practitioner was to complete the whole scope of vascular access from peripheral to central. So now there's nothing on your body that I can't access with ultrasound uh, in one attempt, and that's the goal. Where's the future of this going? I mean, why shouldn't every patient who needs, or family member who needs this kind of treatment have access to it? Steve, let me blow you away with this statistic, okay? In 2014, we did 25% peripherals, the little short IVs uh, in, on my team. In 2016, 80% of the procedures that I do are short peripheral IVs in our patients and only 20% central. Mm -hmm. That's eliminating all the risks of central line infection, carotid hematomas, right. air embolus. It's amazing what you can do when you triage, and I call it de-escalation. We put the simplest device in to get the patient through their yeah. prescribed therapy. Let me ask you, um, how is Angelina doing? Good, thank God. Yeah. She's healthy. She smiles a lot. She does. She's happy. She smiles. She laughs. She likes her music. <laughs> she loves her music. Yeah. And her visits to have her veins. Mm -hmm. Well, she's special. We have each other on speed dial. Yeah. <laughs> you do have each other? Yes. yes. So I have her in mm -hmm. as baby outpatient lab. And if she's coming to the hospital, she'll send me a text. Matt, are you in today? Yeah. We've come in the middle of the I night to. to the emergency room Yeah, once. he's come to the emergency so. room to... And I actually won't let anybody touch Angelina unless I contact him first. 
it's important to have that connection. That relationship. Absolutely. Uh, Matt, Joanna, thank you so much. And to Angelina, we wish her nothing but the best. Thank you. And to your family. Thank Thanks. you so much. Thank you so much, Steve. Stay with us. We'll be right back right after this. To watch more Caucus New Jersey, find us online and follow us on social media. We're talking to one of the organizers of this very important conversation about uh, the police minority relations. She is LaShawn Warren, Vice President and General Counsel, New Jersey Institute for Social Justice. We're here at NJPAC. A critical conversation about race and policing. Why now? Why so critical? Well, there have been a number of important developments in the city of Newark, including the consent decree that was entered into with the city and the United States Department of Justice. And so the, with these developments, we thought that it was a critical time to bring the community together to hear about these developments and give them an opportunity to weigh in. Yeah, we were talking to your, your director, Ryan Haygood, about some of the, there are 10 specific recommendations to improve things that the Institute has put out. Just share a couple um, with us beyond the body cameras for police officers. What are some of the other very concrete recommendations that are being put forth? Because we'll be talking solutions as well as, listen, there'll be some honest, difficult, emotional conversation tonight, but some recommendations. So one of the things that we are urging people to do is to join our New Jersey's Communities Forward initiative. And basically that initiative brings the community and police together and tries to foster better relationships. And in doing that, it creates a safe space for people to have candid, con candid concrete um, conversations and to actually have recommendations for how we can improve community police relations. So I want to be clear, this is this conversation tonight at NJPAC is critical, but it is one of many. It is one of many. One of the things that the consent decree requires is for the monitor to actually do a number of surveys, to survey perceptions of the community and how they feel about policing in the community, and to make sure that we are including their recommendations in the reform efforts. Let me ask you this. We are in Newark tonight, but there's Camden, there's Jersey City, there is Patterson, there is Trenton. We're talking about cities and other communities where things have happened and could happen. Why is Newark's experience so important across the state and nation? Well, I think Newark has a very important and interesting history, um, beginning with the rebellion of 1967, which actually emanated from... John Smith, the cab driver. Right. It emanated from a police community um, connection and um, dispute. And I'm sorry, to be clear, I, I should not have just said that in that way. There was a sense that John Smith, who was a cab driver at the time, um, the police had taken him in and there was questions as to how he was being treated at the police station and there was a sense that something was happening with him down there that was beyond what should have been happening and his vi rights may have been violated and things happened from there. Did I get that wrong? No, that's right. There was police abuse that was um, alleged, um, alleged in, in this particular situation, and it was not, it was symptomatic of many other issues that happened in the community where police abuse was a problem. And so starting with that particular history, Newark is unique in that we've been struggling with this issue for a very long time. And I think what separates um, Newark from some of the other cities is that we have this consent decree. There was a 2014 investigation from the Department of Justice entered it, and, and based on that investigation, we now have this consent decree. So we really do have an opportunity to reform the police department and be a, a model not only for the state, but for the nation. One more question. In your work, have you seen another city or a city, a community that appears to, I'm not going to even say getting, appears to be getting it right, that really seems to be on the right track of police minority relations, really doing good things? I think Newark is d making con a concerted effort to do things right. I can't say that it's the only city that's it's working in that particular space. But, but we're I, on the right track. But we are on the right track. We are not there yet. But... I think in time, with this monitoring team and the reforms that we expect to come out of that, that we will have a class, a class one type of, of, of police department that can serve as a model for the state and indeed the nation. Thank you so much for talking to us, but also for bringing everyone together tonight. Thank you. Junius Williams, Chair, Newark Celebration 350 and Director of the Abbott Leadership Institute at the great Rutgers University in Newark. Amen. Junius, you have seen, you've experienced this issue, this complex set of issues in a way that few others have. 
you were there and you understood 1967, the rebellion, in, in ways others may not have. Tell us where we are today with these issues and what tonight needs to accomplish. Well, unfortunately, we've seemingly only begun the conversation. Uh, there is no closure uh, because it keeps on staying with us. How do we hold the police accountable? And it is a complex issue. It's not just a black or white issue. Uh, it's not just a matter of saying you got to do the right thing. Uh, there's a whole series and set of circumstances that have to be considered before we come up with some answers. So I hope that's what we do tonight. One thing about you that always strikes me is that every time we've spoken, and even though you've been through some challenging situations, you remain optimistic. Talk to us about why you're optimistic in spite of the challenges regarding police minority relations. Young people, young people. Uh, some of them have taken the lessons that uh, we've given them. Uh, some of them realize that they stand on broad shoulders. I know I have standing on the shoulders of people who have come before me. So as long as we can pass that on and people can continue to make it better. I love Black Lives Matter because they are maturing. They're becoming more uh, valuable to us every day. The more I read about them and hear about them. So I think that's why I'm optimistic. Let me play devil's advocate for a second. To what degree do you feel like folks like yourself, who have been leading protests, who have been making change during really, really tough times, how open do you think that the leaders of the Black Lives Matter movement would be to advice from folks like yourself, particularly when it comes to, we were just talking to one of the leaders before about some of the anti-police rhetoric, which clearly comes from a very small fraction uh, faction, if you will, of that organization. Do you engage them? Yes. Some of them listen. Some of them you have to make listen. Uh, because the answer is the answer. Now, whether you take your time and do some study and some research and come up with some information, or whether you get in trouble because you didn't prepare, you're going to get the answer. Just like I had to get the answer. We weren't that accepting we weren't that, that uh, uh, we, we weren't accepting the leadership that had come before us too readily at times but as you get out there in the street and as you grow into the suites you find that uh, there's some things that are just time on it and have to be done finally Tonight would be a success with this conversation here at NJPAC if what happens. This is part of many conversations, but to find success tonight. I think tonight is about conversation. I, I think that Ryan Haygood is on the money for trying to bring... The Institute for Social Justice. The Institute for Social Justice. I think Newark 350, Newark Celebration 350 is very important because we help make some of this possible. Uh, we're very glad to be a part of this. This is a birthday celebration for Newark, but it's also a time for us to move forward. So we have to take that history, rewrap it, repackage it, come up with some new ideas from young people, and see if we can not find a better way to go. To see more Caucus New Jersey with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at steveadubato.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Steve Adubato, Ph.D. And follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. We are pleased to be joined by Dr. Keith LeBeau, who is Chief Clinical Officer, Delta Dental of New Jersey. Good to see you. Thanks, Steve. Great to be here. Um, let's talk a little bit about, um, let me talk to some of your colleagues. People say, I'm going to the dentist and I'm going to get my teeth checked. I'm going to take, something, take care of some of my teeth. But oral health is so much more than that. If you told our producers, hey, wait a minute, we have to look at your full medical history. This is about something bigger than just your teeth. Absolutely. It, it used to be a situation where somebody would go to the dentist and the dentist would still take a full medical history. But the sure. primary reason was really to be able to provide dental care safely. If you think about it, it's one of the few, the few medical areas where virtually every visit is an invasive procedure. Hmm. because something is happening, there's an opportunity to introduce bacteria into the body, and we use anesthetics, and uh, so we want to make sure people can be treated safely. Now, what that's evolving to 
is really a situation where uh, dentists are really becoming a primary care provider. Really? For patients, absolutely. A primary care provider? Uh, Give us an example. Well, for, for example, you know, a lot of patients, there are millions of patients that see their dentist annually, whether it's for routine care or an emergency, who do not see a physician regularly. So the patient goes in to see, the, you know, see their dentist. They haven't seen a physician. Right. And, and the dentist has an opportunity. They, I, I like to call it an at-bat, but they have an opportunity to do a number of things. They could take the patient's blood pressure. They, they could uh, evaluate the patient's... Uh, family history for diabetes and do a risk assessment. They could evaluate whether or not they're at risk for sleep apnea. Uh, and, and, and something that's really, really exciting, back in uh, early 2015, the state of New Jersey uh, Dental Board was very progressive. And they actually you know, stated that it's within the scope of dental practice for dentists to actually do in-office blood testing for diabetes. For diabetes? For diabetes. The dentist would do that? The dentist can do can it. Can do that. Absolutely. Are, are a significant number of them, doctor, doing that? No. Should Not, they be? Well, well, there's definitely an opportunity to do it for patients that have risk factors for diabetes. As a matter of fact... Uh, That's we, why the full medical history matters. Ab absolutely. Right. And, and sometimes it's not in the medical history. You know, for the most part, it's going to be people that don't have an indication that they have diabetes, but... When you look there, their uh, how they appear physically, their family history. Right. Uh, sometimes patients have a certain pattern of periodontal disease, uncontrolled periodontal disease, where you look at them, and, and even that could be very suspicious of somebody having diabetes because there is this relationship between diabetes and periodontal disease. You know, as I listen to you, uh, doctor, it's, it's so clear to me, and I have this particular relationship with our with my dentist. He does, they do, play a bigger and bigger role in our overall health care. Is it changing the way dentists are being trained and their role in society? Definitely. Uh, there is, is a uh, very much more of a, a medical orientation to, to the way dentists are being trained, both while they're in dental school, if they're doing residencies, in hospitals afterwards, but they are, uh, you know, they're coming out there, they're diagnosticians, you know, they, they, uh, they're, they're very well skilled in understanding uh, how systemic issues present orally and, and the risks, you know, the risks of uh, certain oral conditions, you know, systemic conditions uh, in terms of being able to provide safe dental care. Let's talk about this, and by the way, um, the Delta Dental of New Jersey Foundation has been incredibly supportive uh, of a whole range of uh, public awareness efforts and uh, public television through the Caucus Educational Corporation has been doing public awareness of oral health through some of that support. But I also want to be clear that one of the really terrific organizations, the Zoofall Health Organization, has recently received a grant from the foundation for, is it a mobile health van, is it? it, it <clears throat> it's actually a fully equipped two-chair mobile dental unit. And, and what does it do? It, it actually can provide comprehensive dental care for, for Zufall patients who don't have access to transportation to get to one of their physical sites so they could reach out and extend, extend the reach and the scope of care they could provide to people who otherwise wouldn't have access to dental care. It's so you're really going wonderful. to them, sorry for interrupting, you go to them as, a, as opposed to saying, okay, you should be going to a dentist to get this done, you go out to find them. Exactly, exactly. And is that, particularly in urban areas, let's talk about the urban areas, because I know there's a Rutgers connection as well. Uh, I, I know one of the uh, primary uses for the mobile unit is actually gonna be going out more to the, you know, the rural, more to the rural areas where there, there are transportation issues. Sure. Uh, you know, there, there is actually, uh, Zoo Falls has a number of urban-based locations. So I, I think, I, I think the mobile unit specifically is probably more focused towards people that are in the more outlying areas where they don't have access to transportation. But you have helped in urban areas as well. The, the ACA, the Affordable Care Act and dentistry, be more specific, how has it helped children with respect to their oral health? <laughs> that, that, that's interesting. Uh, 
When we look at the people who enrolled in, in ACA-related dental coverage in the state, uh, th there was a significant enrollment. The surprising thing we saw out of all the people enrolled in the exchange or off-exchange-related programs, only about 10% of them were children. Mm. About 90% of them were adults. But it still does provide access to kids for, for comprehensive dental care coverage who otherwise wouldn't have had it. So, so it's, it's really tremendous that way. So it's helped in that way? Definitely. Dr. Keith Lebo, um, who is uh, Chief Clinical Officer of Delta Dental of New Jersey. Um, it's so interesting. People say, I'm going to my dentist to take care of something in my teeth or my gums. You made an important point, and you're making it clear that this is overall health, and dentists are playing a more important role than ever before in our health overall. Thank you, doctor, for teaching us. We appreciate it. Thank you so much. The Thank preceding you. program has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence, and 13 for WNET, NJTV, and WHYY. Funding for this edition of Caucus New Jersey has been provided by Adler Aphasia Center, Wells Fargo, Seton Hall University, PSE&G, New Jersey Sharing Network, NJM, and by Josh S. Weston. Promotional support provided by NJ.com, Small News, Big News, True Jersey, and by Commerce Magazine. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. Caucus New Jersey has been produced in partnership with TriStar Studios. Hi, I'm Peter Rooney. In 2006, I lost my father to renal disease. He was on the waiting list for a new kidney, but did not receive one in time. Unfortunately, so many like my father have lost their lives while waiting for a life-saving organ. At New Jersey Sharing Network, we're committed to saving and enhancing people's lives through organ and tissue donation and by informing people about this important decision because you can make a difference and save a life.